will be Holger Brenner, who will be giving his third talk, and it will be on vector bundles and tight closure. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. So uh, what I forget, forgot to mention yesterday is the direct relation between uh, tight closure and Hilbert Kunz theory. So I have written down this theorem due to Hoxter and Unicke. So no typical situation where we talk about tight closure, a local Noetherian ring of positive characteristic and with some minor extra conditions like analytically unramified and formally equidimensional. So don't, don't take too much attention to that thing. And I is a primary ideal, primary to the maximal ideal. Now then we have the equivalence that F belongs to the tight closure if and only if the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ideal I equals the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ideal generated together by I and the extra element F. No, so that means that if you uh, uh, throw F into, well, make the ideal a little bit bigger by throwing in F, that does not change the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity. No, if and only if F belongs to the tight closure. So that's again um, a way to look at are the uh, tight closure is really tight, meaning that uh, no, an element F is inside if it does not change the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity. No. Okay. And the last statement I had yesterday was this. We are in a two-dimensional standard graded normal uh, situation. And uh, we consider the corresponding smooth projective curve. We have a homogeneous ideal primary to the irrelevant ideal generated by elements f1 up to fn of degree di, and we look at the corresponding CCG module, CCG sheaf, CCG bundle, whatever. And the condition here is that this is uh, strong, strongly semi-stable. And uh, then the statement is that we have a, an exact degree bound for tight closure. So the, whether an element belongs to the tight closure of, of the ideal or not depends primarily on the degree. So we have suddenly a degree um, ch a, 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 a change of the behavior depending on the degree. And the degree bound is this number. So the sum of the degrees involved divided by n minus 1. No, and the statement is above this degree bound, everything is in the tight closure. Below the degree bound, it's only inside the tight closure if it belongs to the uh, Frobenius closure. And even that, usually here, Frobenius, that you really have to go to the Frobenius, to Frobenius powers is an exception. So morally, you can think only if F belongs to the ideal. And maybe we look at two cases. So let's look at the parameter case. So we have just two uh, generators. Then that was known much long before, even for you know, in all dimensions, um, that you know, in this statement we have just here the sum of the two degrees divided by one. No, so here the degree bound is uh, d1 plus d2. And uh, so this, this property is here trivial because the synergies of two parameters, this is just the structure sheaf, but now I have to, uh, in degree, uh, I think like that. No, so that would be the graded isomorphism you, you have here. 
No, and the invertible sheaf is always strongly semi-stable. It's always semi-stable and uh, the pullback is invertible. So the concept of semi-stability was not invented for invertible sheaves. It was invented for vector bundles of higher rank. No? So you get this immediately. And uh, no, for example, yesterday, Keiichi looked at the Fermat cubic. No, and this is a standard example of tight closure theory. So Z square is in the tight closure of X and Y. Oh, and you see oh, X, X has degree 1, Y has degree 1, Z square has degree 2. No? And maybe I also say, no, yesterday I talked about the the co cohomology class corresponding to this data. Uh, so the cohomology class would just be here, z square. So in, in Czech notation, z square over x, y. So in a parameter case, it's always just the element uh, divided by the product of the two parameters. So the Czech class is very easy here. No, so that's the Czech class in H1 over the curve and here no, the degree is then, so you are then in the zero shift, which you usually don't write, of course. No. Let's stick to this ring and make one generator more, which is also a classical example. And this is already quite needs some effort uh, to show that that the product of the so in this ring, the product of the variables is inside the, the tight closure of the ideal generated by the squares of the variables. Now, if you count again, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6 divided by 2 is 3. And you know, on the left-hand side, we have an element of degree 3. So that's the interesting case. So in, ah, if you get rid of, the, of x, it's not true. Then you are below the degree bound, and that's, that's not wrong. Now, so this was not the... Uh, uh, the first proof of that was, was by Anurag Singh. And with the method of the syzygies, this is now very trivial. So we look at, on the corresponding elliptic curve, we look at the syzygies. And you know, this guy produces a cohomology class. And I do not, I could write it down how it looks like, but um, that's not important right now. We just know that there is a cohomology class. No? And uh, now the curve equation, we can immediately, and here I should give the degree three shift no? because of that. Uh, no, always the, the degree of the element we are under, uh, want to understand whether it belongs to the high closure. This degree is, is here as the degree shift. And the curve equation gives us a global section of this bundle just by sending 1 to x, y, z. Now you see x, y, z is a syzygy because x times x squared plus y times y squared plus z times z squared is zero by the curve equation. And uh, so this is injective. And on the other hand, no, because we know the degree, we know the rank. So here we have something of rank uh, one again, well, rank two. And the degree is zero, is zero. So therefore, it also has to be zero. And uh, it cannot be another line bundle, so it's also the structure sheaf. No, so we have this nice um, sequence. And by that sequence, we see immediately that this is uh, semi-stable. This is semi-stable. 
And uh, we also see immediately that it's strongly semi-stable because if we pull back the whole situation, the left and the right will be the same. No. There's also even a theorem that on an elliptic curve, semi-stable is already strongly semi-stable. So the elliptic curve is, is uh, easier than uh, curves of higher genius. So the phenomenon that a semi-stable bundle is not necessarily strongly semi-stable occurs in starting with genus 2. So this is strongly semi-stable. It has the degree, you know, you, so we can apply this uh, theorem. Therefore, we get this result without any further computation. No? I mean, you can try to do that by hand to, to really look at the definition of tight closure and uh, good luck with that. Okay. So, that's the case of the strong semi-stable bundle. Now we want to have a characterization of, uh, of the general case. And um, I go back to the situation where we study, in general, um, a locally free sheaf. So C is our smooth projective curve. And S is locally free on the curve, positive characteristic. And we have a cohomology class, a first cohomology class. I mean, there are no other cohomology classes. Now, and you see already here, for example, in that example, uh, that well, it, it, it might be, so we have here a cohomology class in a CCG bundle, but in order to understand that, we have to look at certain exact sequences, and there is no reason why the other uh, sheaves occurring in these sequences should be also CCG bundles in a natural way. So it's better to work in general for um, for uh, locally free sheaves. No, and our, the question which we came up, which was a translation of the tight closure inclusion question, is whether the torsor defined by this cohomology class is a, an, a fine scheme or not. No, that's the setting. And... Um, The main characterization uses, again, the strong hardener or Simran filtration. No, so, and we have mentioned that such a thing exists, so that S1 in S2 in ST minus 1, or ST, and that is the... Now here, E is really 1E, maybe. We should write E0 or something. No? So that's the, that's the strong Hardener or Simhan filtration. And uh, the slopes of the quotients are decreasing. No? So we have mu S1 is larger than mu. So S1 is also called the maximal destabilizing uh, subsheaf. No? Here we have this, oh, and it goes on like uh, here we have, at the end we have S modulo, so the slope of this guy. That is just to remember. And now, I mean, the interesting case is when some of these slopes are positive and some are negative. If everything is positive, it's trivial. If everything is negative, it's trivial. Uh, no, the interesting thing, if we have uh, here something negative, here something positive. No, and then we look at, um, say, I should have the property that uh, no, as I, I mean, the slope is positive if and only if the degree is positive. So this uh, has a non-negative degree. And the next, so SI plus 1 modulo SI has degree negative. No, we'll look somehow. I mean, if, if it doesn't, if, if only this exists, uh, that's 
in some sense uh, also considered. Now, and now we look at, it seems to be a long theorem. <laughs> so now we look at this guy modulo S i. Now, so basically, basically we have F e s, we have here s i, which contains all the non-negative stuff in some sense, no, and here we have the quotient, uh, which contains all the um, stuff of negative degree, no, so that we denote by q i. No? You can also think, if you go some Frobenius powers higher, you can even assume that the Frobenius pullback is the direct sum of these quotients. No, it's a direct sum. Then it gets ah, not really much easier, but it's more or less the same. No? And um, we have here our cohomology class, C. And uh, no, due to the long exact sequence in cohomology, this class has here an image class. Uh, do we give it a name? Maybe we don't give it a name. No, we don't give it. Now we have all the data which we need to uh, formulate our theorem. So the theorem is now that the torsor belonging to this class is a fine, I think I, I formulated it with not a fine, not a fine scheme, so corresponding not belonging to the tight, uh, belonging to the tight closure, if and only if the image of the cohomology class of C inside H1 of this guy is not zero, but to be fair, one has to say it's not uh, killed, not annihilated by Frobenius. So you should think of this theorem as a as a, as a degree criterion, but taking into consideration the strong Hardener Simran filtration. No, you need the strong Hardener Simran filtration. That's the easiest case. No? The, the, you just, S is, is strongly semi stable itself. Then it's just a question of having positive, non negative, or negative degree. No, but here, it depends, so if, if the class is non-zero the, on the positive side, it belongs to the tight closure. If it here goes to zero or is killed by a Frobenius, then going some, some etage uh, higher, you can assume it is zero, then the class comes from that side and then it will be uh, inside the tight closure. No? Oh. And the scheme will not be a fine. No, so that's the general statement which characterizes uh, a fine torsos. Now today I want to talk about the plus closure and its relation to tight closure. Um, so maybe I can motivate it from the geometric side. So here we have our curve, we have our torsor, oh, looks like that, TC, and uh, now if, well, and for that it's, I think, this interpretation with the extension, so projective bundle of an extension without PS, this is quite uh, helpful. So maybe we draw this 
No, this is the torso, which is each fiber is an affine space, but here we have the projective closure, and then we have a projective bundle. No, but the torso, you regain the torso by looking at the projective bundle minus the, the hyper, a hyperplane bundle. No? Projective hyperplane bundle. No, and for tight closure, we are interested in the cohomology property of that thing, whether, it is, uh, whether this guy is affine or not. And um, so don't ask me what this noise is. Not a fine. And the easiest way to detect that this torso is not a fine is if we can find a curve inside the torso dominating the base. And by that I mean a curve inside the torso. So, of course, there are many curves inside. But most curves, um, if you think of that guy, most curves will meet somehow uh, this divisor. And then they are, they are not completely inside the torso. No, so we are thinking about, do there exist curves in PS prime which do not meet this uh, projective subbundle, which are completely inside the torso. And because it's a projective curve, as a no? subscheme of a projective, no, everything is projective, subscheme of something projective. Um, and if it would not meet this thing, then it's a projective curve inside the torso, and then the torso cannot be an affine scheme, because affine schemes do not contain projective curves. No? So you can think of that, if we know a cohomological property, does there exist a geometric reason for that? Now, if we have, you can also, uh, I mean, you can do it on all levels. No? If, if you have a projective curve inside, there will be cohomology, and as a closed subscheme, also there will be cohomology of the torso, no? non-trivial torso. So you should think of the question, is there... Yeah, is there, so in case it is not a fine, is there a geometric reason? No, the existence of a curve inside the torso would be a geometric reason uh, for the torso not to be a fine. Not to be fine. Now that is the question how I will um, address it. So the corresponding algebraic notion, which came first, is just the following. F belongs to the same notation, to the plus closure, if and only if there exists a finite map from R to some ring. No, the important thing is finite. Uh, such that F belongs to the extended ideal. No? And we had some, so assume that, that uh, everything is F finite, then uh, in particular you can, you can take the Frobenius. No, but there are also other uh, relevant finite extensions where something can happen. No? Um, no, and it's known that the plus closure is a subset of the tight closure. That is not a difficult uh, theorem. So whenever you can, uh, after going to a finite extension, it's inside the extended ideal, you know that it's in the tight closure. And uh, so, so that was called a question. That was in, in particular a question because of the relevance for the localization problem, whether this is just the same. And uh, 
Oxter calls this the tantalizing question. So I never heard about this word before, but it sounds good, no? tantalizing question. So tomorrow I will, say, uh, I will show that this is not true in general. Today I will show that it's true in, the, in this setting with an additional assumption that we are working over a finite field. No? Um, so, of course, there are many finite, maybe one should restrict to a domain to make it life a little bit easier. Um, you could also say we look at the absolute integral closure. No, that is, so you go to a quotient field, to an algebraically closed closure of the quotient field, and you look at the integral closure. So that is called the absolute plus closure. No, and then you can just say uh, the, tight, uh, the, the plus closure is just contraction from this large ring. No, I mean, this is highly non Noetherian. Maybe Kevin knows something about it. It's a, no, one of the nice theorems is that in positive characteristics, this is a big Cohen Macaulay algebra, no? not highly non Noetherian. No? Uh, okay. No, and of course, of course, it contains the perfection of the ring. Okay. Um, so, no, and again, so because I work in the, again, our normal standard graded two-dimensional, I will work with the graded plus closure. So I, I look only here at graded extension. But with degree shifts are allowed. No, if you have Frobenius, you will have uh, definitely a degree shift. Not the shift, the shift you have to multiply by, by something, not by P. Um, okay. No, and uh, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. So basically, in this situation, we can say so F belongs in the. Now, again, I, I, I also stick to the primary case. Um, I belongs, F belongs to the graded plus closure of the ideal. No, it means. You have here a graded finite map, but if you have a graded finite map, then you have a corresponding map of curves. No, so then you have, there exists a curve C prime to C um, such that the, let's call it phi, the, the, the pullback of the cohomology class uh, inside the, that's the one, um, the first cohomology of the, the curve on the left of the pullback of the CCG bundle, which I denote by S here, uh, is zero. Is zero. No? And here, maybe at first, Step S is maybe not normal, but you can well, you can here go to the normalization, or you can go here to the normalization. So then you can only have to look at smooth projective curves. No? So the question is, um, oops, oops. the question is basically, can you kill a cohomology class by a by, uh, by going to another curve. No? So how can you characterize that? No, so. no. As before, we translate everything to the curve. So we have a, we have a locally free sheaf. We have a cohomology class of that locally free sheaf. We have a cohomology class. And the question is, 
uh, can we or when when can we uh, kill C by a curve map, of course a non-constant curve map, uh, which is then automatically finite C prime to C. No? And part of it is what can we kill by Frobenius, what can we kill by other stuff. No? So the, uh, the Frobenius itself uh, plays or carries a leading role, but the, the Frobenius alone is not enough. What can be killed by Frobenius would be corresponding to the Frobenius closure. Um, okay. Now that's the question. Now and uh, ah, the the lemma relating it with that. So um, yeah. Uh, so equivalent. The following are equivalent. Du, 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 du. Yeah. Now, at this situation, so um, C oh, ah. no. there exists finite map C prime to C such that the pullback of C is zero and the second thing is the torsor T C contains a projective curve, which is exactly this property I was talking about. No? And it's quite yeah quite immediately. Now, I mean, the main point is the torsor of C is the universal object which kills the, the cohomology class. If you pull back the class to the torsor itself, then it's zero. But of course, the torsor is not finite. No, and if you have such a curve, maybe you have to go to the normalization. So we, here we don't say anything about whether it has to be a smooth curve. Uh, but if it's trivial on a torso, then it's also trivial on that curve, and then it will be trivial on the normalization of the curve. And the other way is, is similar. No, so that's quite uh, easy. Um, okay. Okay. Um, no, and uh, so the goal is for today to prove this, or the graded case of, which is stronger, the graded case of this um, under the assumption that the field is finite or that the field is the algebraic closure of a finite field. And this is really an essential uh, property we need here. I would like to leave this because I will use it later. No, and uh, I would say a direct proof in the setting of commutative algebra is more or less out of reach. Uh, I think you have to go uh, this way, this interpretation on the, on the curve so that I don't need any more. Mm. No, and so the, what we want to show is that the property which characterizes by this theorem the non-affiness of the torso will be the same criterion which uh, characterizes this property. No, and so the two properties being non-affine, having a projective curve, are not directly related, but they are related via this, um, yeah, this uh, no, semi-stability stuff and this numerical criterion. No? So I think of that as a more or less as a numerical criterion for 
uh, for tight closure. Now, so our goal is what, how to kill uh, cohomology classes. And this question is, by the way, very different in, in characteristic zero. In characteristic zero, you can basically kill nothing. You can only kill, if you have a normal thing, you have the trace map, you can kill nothing. In positive characteristic, you can kill a lot. But how much we can kill, we will see. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah. So, so we need some, some concepts here. So S, always a locally free sheaf is called um, et al. trivializable if there exists, so this is trivialization of a bundle, if there exists a map, so I always mean a finite map of smooth projective curve, uh, such that the pullback of S is just, no, S has a certain rank, this is just OC prime to the power R. Of course, that you can only expect if you have degree zero. No. Uh, so that is uh, et al, trivializable. And um, so there is the following theorem, which is, so I know it from, so it looks like several people have proved this. I know it from Lange, from a paper of Lange and Stuhler, but it's also sometimes assigned to Mumford and also to Katz. So, whatever. Uh, no, and it basically says you can trivialize a bundle, no, and this map should in that case be etal. Etal. Etal and finite, no? Um, so S is etal trivializable if and only if you have a repetition in the Frobenius pullbacks. So if there exists some E such that, no, now I mean the Frobenius pullback of S is isomorphic to S. No, I mean, if you have the bundle S, you can yeah, apply the Frobenius on it how often you want. And maybe they are isomorphic as uh, abstract locally free sheaves or not. And here, we require that some Frobenius pullback is uh, isomorphic to S itself. Then you can trivialize it by an etal map. No, and uh, it's quite uh, surprisingly explicit, this, this statement. You can really write down matrices and derive from that uh, curve equation where you can do that. Okay. Okay, and uh, now we do, I mean, here we started understanding the tight closure behavior by first understanding the strong semi-stable case that we will also do now. Um, so we first consider the strongly semi-stable case and uh, whether a cohomology class can be killed or not. And first, we need a positive result. So, so it's first in, so now, this is now the first time and the, maybe the main time, so K is a finite field. 
or KE is, is the algebraic closure of a finite field. No, that would be also as you please. That, that, that doesn't make a difference. And we have our curve. And um, so S is strongly semi-stable. of degree zero. Now the degree zero is the, the interesting case where, where, where most of the phenomena really occur. Now then the statement is then there exists E prime larger than E such that the E prime uh, Frobenius pullback of S is isomorphic to the ETH Frobenius pullback of S. Now this is looks similar, but it's not the same. Now here we have uh, uh, some some E on both sides, no? and um, now the point is a proof is quite easy now. Well. It uses heavy machinery in the background. But we just look, look at the family of all Frobenius pullbacks. Now, and by our assumption, they are all semi-stable because S is strongly semi-stable. And they are all of degree zero. Now, I mentioned that this whole idea of semi-stable bundles was uh, invented to be in order to construct uh, moduli spaces for bundles. And so here, no, it has a certain, and, and the rank is, of course, fixed. So we, there exists the moduli space of degree zero rank R bundles. And so all these objects, they, now, if this is the moduli space, they are all points in the moduli space. Now, that's the idea of the moduli space. And now, everything is defined over our finite field, or maybe a, the algebraic closure of a finite field. But S is definitely defined over some finite field. Now, you only need this data. And by doing this process, the pullbacks are defined over the same field. And the model, no, that's the, 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 the joke of the moduli space, that it's, a, it's really a, var a variety. And the variety has only finitely many points over a finite field. Now, think of projective space. You can say which, which points are over, defined over a finite field. Now, so We have an infinite family in a, in a finite set of points, and therefore we, we have a repetition. No, that's it. No? Okay. So you only need boundedness of the family, but this is the uh, important step to construct moduli spaces. Okay. So next step. Theorem now S is uh, strongly semi stable and it has uh, the degree is non negative. Mm. And uh, C is a cohomology class. Then the statement is then there exists. C prime to C such that um, the pullback of the class is zero. No? So phi kills the cohomology class. No? So how does that go? So first, if the degree if the degree of S is positive, then we can take the Frobenius even. Because no, um, by pulling back, so S has, say, S has degree 1, then the pullback has degree P. Pullback, uh, and even you have to multiply by the rank, I think. So the, 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 the degree is then, by looking at the Frobenius pullbacks, the degree is getting arbitrarily large. Um, 
and, uh, and they stay semi-stable and therefore uh, there will be no, um, um, no cohomology anymore. No, they, they are getting ample, you can say. No, the Frobenius pullback of S, if S is positive, Frobenius pullback is very, very positive, and at one point these bundles will become ample, and then there is no cohomology inside anymore. Oh, by by Sayer duality and semi stability. You, that, that you need here. No? Okay, so here you can Frobenius. So now the case where the degree is zero. No, then we are in this situation. And then we first go no, the, the, the smaller number. We go by Frobenius. And then uh, after this, pulling back the situation to see via the E Frobenius, we have that uh, this guy and uh, a further pullback is isomorphic, but then we are in this situation. So here on, after Frobenius pullback, we uh, arrive this, this uh, situation. And of course, uh, so, so always now a finite field. So that is really important. Or over a finite field. No? And then by this thing we have here C prime, so here Frobenius and here et al. And so S, the pullback of the complete thing here is uh, trivial. No? So now we have a cohomology class. Uh, see, no, the prime is here. Now we have a cohomology class uh, inside... Uh, the structure sheaf or the half power of the structure sheaf, but that we, now we can co consider the components. We consider the components and uh, now we have to kill the components and then either we can use uh, the parameter theorem of Karen Smith that uh, tight closures plus closure for parameter ideals or even easier, we can even show that either, so we can, no, we look what does the Frobenius to that thing. And the Frobenius kills part of it, maybe nothing, maybe everything. And what is not killed by Frobenius, there is a basis where the pullback of the cohomology class goes to itself. And from that, we can build so-called Artin Schreier extensions to kill the class. No, so either kill by Frobenius or Artin Schreier sequences, or ex Artin Schreier extensions, sorry. Okay, um, dum -dum -dum, that's this, that's this. Okay, no, and so the last theorem is now, um, maybe I do it with blue for plus. So now we change this theorem. Now we say over a finite field. And um, no, so this, this and that, this basically is the basis to prove the same theorem for, for, um, for uh, containing a, a projective curve. So here, instead of not being not affine, we write uh, contains a projective curve. No, and projective curve is the same as uh, being killed by a finite extension. No? No, and then finally, so uh, for C, we can say now finally, the to uh, finite field, that is, uh, TC is not a fine if and only if TC contains, so there, there is a geometric reason for it, contains a projective curve 
other class is killed by, um, by going to a finite extension. No, and uh, so that's a theorem. Oops. And going back to our algebraic setting, um, our normal two-dimensional two-dimensional finite field field we have that uh, tight closure tight closure equals graded plus closure and then it's also plus closure no? and uh, so this is for the homogeneous ideals Dietz has extended this to to um, non-homogeneous ideals. So still in the, in the homogeneous ring, graded case, dimension two, but then he found a way to generalize, out, starting from this, uh, also to non-homogeneous ideals. And I think that's, that's it for today. Thank you. So are there any questions? Yeah. Why is that true? Yeah. Yeah. S is zero. I go here. And here I have this isomorphism where we have E and E prime. But if we first do the E Frobenius, then we have here something, and here basically we have E no, on. So that is the first step. And here, say, if T is Fe uh, F -E of S, then for T, we have, I think, no, something like that, E prime minus E of T is then isomorphic to that guy. And for this T, we apply Lange Stuhler to get the trivialization of T. And so all together we get applying Frobenius and applying the, the et al. map coming from Lange Stuhler, we get the trivialization of the vector bundle. That's, that's the point. Sorry, one more small thing. Yeah, sure, but still, if I have a strongly semi-stable bundle defined over algebraically, the algebraic closure of a finite field, then the data which are relevant will be belong to a finite field. And then I do it, uh, and, and the, the Frobenius pullbacks of them, they are also defined over this finite field. And so all the points which occur here are over this finite field. That's, that's the argument. Of course, the modular space is, is infinite, but the, the, the FQ points are finite. Are there any more questions? Not we'll just thank the speaker. And our next talk will begin in three minutes. Oh.